let's go ahead and finish up our discussion of uh, microbial virulence with uh, looking at portals of exit and modes of transmission. The real key to remember with portals of exit is that the way a microbe gets out of a human host typically mimics the way it got in. So, for example, if it's a respiratory tract pathogen that got in through respiratory epithelial secretions, it's likely to get out through respiratory epithelial secretions. Same for a GI tract infection, for genital urinary tract, skin wound infection. Uh, and then if we've got insect vectors involved, if it required an insect to get in, it's going to require an insect to get out as well. So that's the general rule for these portals of exit. Now specifically, let's look at the modes of transmission. How does it actually get from one person to the next? We're going to divide them up into three categories. We're going to talk about contact transmission, vehicle transmission, and vector transmission. And there will be some subtypes within each of them. With contact transmission, there we go, with contact with contact transmission, we're going to have uh, direct, indirect, and droplet transmission. Direct contact transmission, just as the name implies, means there's person-to-person -person contact. So that could be touching, kissing, scratching, sexual intercourse, or in some cases, person-to-reservoir contact, when we think of the reservoir as something like an animal. Um, think about uh, the bird flu, for example. Uh, avian influenza H5N1 is transmitted from an infected bird directly to a patient, to a, a human being, through direct contact transmission. Indirect contact transmission uses something called a fomite, or sometimes pronounced fomity, that is an inanimate object acting as an intermediate. You can probably think of some things. Uh, the pen that you're chewing on right now, um, your toothbrush that should have been dry when you woke up this morning and it was wet because one of your kids or one of your roommates or somebody apparently was using it, or a doorknob. Any of these things can act as a fomity or a fomite involved in indirect contact transmission. Wow, this thing is jumping around on me for some reason. And then finally, finally we have droplet contact transmission. This is when mucus droplets, sometimes called droplet nuclei, travel less than one meter, and that's kind of the operational definition here, through talking, coughing, sneezing. So somebody sneezes and there's uh, contact from the droplet nuclei to the next host, and it's less than a meter apart. So we're standing right next to each other. You sneeze, I inhale those droplets that you sneezed, and I get sick. We're going to call that droplet contact transmission. All right, now, vehicle transmission has absolutely nothing to do with your car. Vehicle transmission is when there is a vehicle involved, and that vehicle can be air, water, or food. So, Airborne vehicle transmission is when we've got a spread of pathogens more than one meter in those aerosols. So now you and I are standing next to each other and you sneeze, but instead of me inhaling it, somebody 10 meters away, somebody at the other end of the room inhales it 20 minutes later and gets sick. We would consider that an airborne vehicle mode of transmission. Waterborne, where water is acting as a vehicle, uh, and in some cases as a reservoir. We hear about contaminated water all the time. Think, for example, of the cholera pathogen uh, in the Haiti crisis, where water is acting as a vehicle for transmission. And then finally, foodborne. We think of foodborne infections, where live bacteria are consumed and then proceed to infect the intestinal tract. Uh, or um, we can have a food intoxication, where the pathogen in its, uh, itself may not still be alive in the food, but its toxins are. And the effect of the toxins are what we're most concerned with in that type of a foodborne uh, vehicle mode of transmission. Okay, so contact transmission, vehicle transmission. One more vehicle I want to mention. Those of you that work in a clinic, if we consider body fluids a vehicle, that, that's a, a wise way of thinking about it. Let's say you're transporting a urine sample, you're transporting blood samples. Those samples, those clinical samples, have the potential to transmit pathogens if mishandled, if someone trips and falls, whatever it happens to be. So we can think of body fluids as an alternative vehicle of transmission. Finally, vector. Vector refers to something alive 
Typically it's biting, though not always, and it's, um, it's required to get moved around. So a biological vector is required for the host, for, pardon me, for the pathogen life cycle, and these are usually biting insects. Think about mosquitoes and ticks, for example. So this would be a biological vector. A mechanical vector is where the the uh, typically insect, but the, the animal vector, does not necessarily um, play a role in the life cycle of the organism. It just sort of picks it up on accident. You think about flies uh, on poop and just picking up the bacteria from the poop on their legs and then transferring them to, I don't know, a sandwich in your kitchen. Or... Um, or a cockroach scuttling around the kitchen, picking up microbes and then transferring them to different places within the kitchen. So we would consider that a mechanical vector of transmission. In both cases, the vector is a living thing, most often an insect, though we could also consider things like bats to be vectors. Um, sometimes other animals can be involved. Um, but then we want to divide the vector into biological versus mechanical, depending on whether or not um, the pathogen is picked up just sort of on accident on body parts like legs or if it's actually ingested carries out part of its life cycle and then is reintroduced into the next host so those are the main modes of transmission that you need to learn